So today we're going to describe another important phenomenon in uh, piezoelectric materials, or, or rather it's a material class, and it's called ferroelectric. materials. And if we're going to classify all materials, uh, if we want to make a really general statement, we'd say we have all materials. And um, amongst these materials, you know, every material like metals, semiconductor, Materials, electric materials, ceramics, polymers, all materials. And then one of these branches is going to be ferroelectric materials. Rather, sorry, one of these branches is going to be polar materials. You know, uh, atoms in, I mean, compounds with a spontaneous polarization. And of course we'll have nonpolar, but we're not really interested in that right now. So within polar materials, uh, we're going to have ferroelectric. I'm just going to write Fe, which is this yeah, Fe. And we're going to have you know, non-ferroelectric. And the practical materials which are used uh, as piezoelectric materials, they are ferroelectric. Or rather, uh, if, you, if you, rather what we can do is this. This is a better uh, demonstration. We can say that polar materials, some of them are piezoelectric, And some of those piezoelectrics are ferroelectric. Some of them are non-ferroelectric. And let's, I'll describe now what a ferroelectric material is. So last time we drew, or a few times ago, we drew a tetragonal unit cell of barium titanate. So we had the titanium displaced, we said, let's call this the middle line, and we had some oxygen atoms that you normally were in the middle, they kind of also got displaced. And I mentioned we can go back and forth between these two states, or actually there are well, how many equivalent polarization directions? Six, because there's six faces. And this is for the tetragonal. Now, um, I mentioned just for the sake of argument, just draw the other case, which can happen. where we have the um, molecules again like this but except they can be reversed on the other direction so we'll have the titanium atom over here and the, uh, the oxygen atoms will be displaced let's draw this box again the oxygen atoms can be displaced so these are, the, these are two equivalent states but some materials they can't do this, and and I, and I remember I, we we said that we can get back and forth between between this state and that state by applying stress, or by applying electric field. We can jump between these two states. But there's also, and this is actually called ferroelectricity. So ferroelectricity, ferroelectric material. What is it? It's a material with a 
reversible. Or you could say rotatable. Or have or it's a material reversible rotatable um, dipole slash spontaneous polarization. So basically, by applying a field, we can change this from this side, this side, this orientation from that orientation. But this fact, uh, it's actually very important for practical materials, but this fact is not possible with all piezoelectric materials. So an example of a famous piezoelectric material which is polar, but it is not ferroelectric, meaning that if you apply an electric field or if you apply a stress, we can't get it to change its polarization state. That an example, a good example of this material is quartz. So no matter, uh, I can't really draw the diagram for you right now, but if no matter if we have a slab of quartz uh, and we have a polarization vector there, and this is not true for all forms of quartz. All forms of quartz are not piezoelectric, but the one that is, uh, even, no matter what kind of electric field you apply this way, let's say, electric field, you will not get this polarization vector to reverse, such that when you release the field, we'll have this type of polarization. This will not happen. So there's a difference between ferroelectric and non-ferroelectric. And it is actually very important to understand uh, why piezoelectric materials that we use in practice are ferroelectric. So actually, uh, in theory, we have, oh, not in theory, but we have two different types of piezoelectric ceramics. So we're, we're going to start talking about ceramics. Piezoelectric materials come in both ceramics and polymers. Uh, and the famous example of a ceramic is lead zirconate titanate, uh, which has this symbol orientation, and a, and a very famous polymer, which has exhibits piezoelectricity, is called PVDF, PVDF, polyvinyl difluoride. But for the purpose of this course, we're going to be mainly focusing on this material uh, and on this class of materials of ceramics. So piezoelectric, you know, ceramics, they have two, you could say, categories based on their structure. They are first um, polycrystalline, or they are single crystals. Now these t different types of piezoelectricity, I mean piezoelectric materials, are sometimes very similar in their chemical makeup, but they're very different in their structure, um, and they're very different in their price, and they're very different in the amount and the size you can buy them in and purchase them in, and they're very different in their properties. Um, so we're going to take a look at now what is a polycrystalline material. I mentioned that we have these things called domains in piezoelectric materials. So we have sometimes polarization vectors of a certain portion of the material going one way and a certain portion going the other way and we may find another portion going that way. And in between we have domain walls. Uh, but what I want to highlight now is what is this idea of polycrystalline. So it's a sort of macro, it's above domain. So first we have the unit cell. We're going to go from small to big. We're going to go like this. So first we have the unit cell. First we have the, actually we have atoms. And then we have the unit cell. And then we have domains. You know all the areas with the same spontaneous polarization. And then beyond domains we have grains. And then beyond grains, and I'll be defining what grains are, this is what is the distinguishes polycrystalline materials. We have grains and beyond grains we just have, I guess, samples of material. So then we just have the macroscopic material.
So now we're, we're going to understand what grains are. And grains, uh, I said they contain domains and they contain atoms and they contain um, uh, they contain unit cells. So basically if we look at a picture so if we look at a picture of a polycrystalline material uh, we have our uh, we have our material and within the material I'm drawing this we have microscopic size grains we have these borders here and I'll explain what these are in just a moment and within these microscopic size grains we have these domains I'll draw that in a different color and within these domains we have unit cells so each of these domains for example we're going to have a domain going different directions and these domains and, uh, and this continues on for the rest of them but we'll just, we're just now we're going to draw it a little bit more clear uh, for the sake of these atoms. So we'll have within the, the domains we have we'll have unit cells, and within these unit cells we'll have atoms in a row. We'll have these atoms. So we realize the uh, the unit cells make up the domains, and domains you know they're they're, they're together they're bonded perfectly together and they're not disrupting the crystal symmetry, uh, but there is some tension in between these different states of polarization which exist. And within, um, and then within those, and, and on the greater size, there's something called grains. Where grains are actually imperfections. So this is not a perfect bond between these, this atom here and this atom over here. There's not going to be a perfect bond that we normally expect from a, uh, from you know, from the atoms. You know, atoms going to be here, atoms here, and then atom here, atom here, and then this keeps going like this. But when we hit a grain boundary, we may have something like this, like let's say like that. And you may have something like the atoms here and the atoms here, and there's there's some there's some disruption. There can often be impurities at these grain boundaries. <coughs> so these grain boundaries are sometimes uh, what happens when a material sort of when during the processing of the material we don't get perfect bonding in between uh, the some of the atoms. These atoms tend to kind of nucle nucleate. Uh, with each other, and therefore uh, we get, and and therefore we get these things called grains, which are kind of like big blotchy things. These the grains, um, they, so there, the, and within grains we have a. Uh, usually we have smooth smooth connectivity smooth connectivity and within grains we also have domains domains are sort of this 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 you know are sort of invasion of this this of this connect connect connectivity but the crystal pattern remains the same although we may have some small change I mentioned A to C ratios you know 1% difference there's a 1% difference between A and C so therefore we can still maintain this smooth co uh, connectivity connectivity uh, despite the fact that we have different polarization directions but when the grain ends and the other grain starts we don't have this smooth uh, connection anymore and there's some some type of a disruption at that boundary thanks for watching